In the 14th century, you couldn't post your letters into the nearest postbox and expect them to be delivered within a few days. Postboxes and the postal service that went with them were 19th century inventions. If you wanted to send a letter, you had to pay someone to carry it. For most people, that didn't matter, since they lived near everyone they knew or might need to communicate with and could either visit them or send a servant. There were, however, some people for whom being able to get a letter to the other side of the country, or even the other side of Europe, was very important and some of them developed reliable means of doing so. Probably the best medieval postal service was developed by Italian merchants. European trade was dominated by merchants from Florence, Venice, and Genoa. This meant that their goods were transported all over Europe. Initially, they traveled with their wares, but around the middle of the 13th century, the businesses of the great merchant houses got to be so large that that was no longer possible. As soon as they had to trust their goods to other people, the merchants needed to have some kind of courier service in place to carry messages back and forth about the progress of their goods, the cost of tolls on the route, and the prices the goods could be expected to fetch when they reached their destination. They also needed to be able to send messages to the people carrying their goods should their original plans change and to their customers. The solution was to set up courier services made up of men and horses who could travel quickly up and down a single route. For about a hundred years each of the great merchant houses had its messengers, but it was a very expensive undertaking. In 1357 17 Florentine companies joined together to provide a single service. Their goods were all following the same routes, more or less, so it made sense to cooperate in this one area. They set up the Casella Day and it wasn't long before merchants in other places followed suit. This postal service was expensive because it required many couriers and even more horses. Each route had several couriers with changes of horses available to them along the way. There were thousands of letters to be carried each year, so the men were kept busy. The main routes from Florence went to Barcelona and Bruges. The latter could be by way of Cologne or Paris. From Barcelona, the couriers could cross the Mediterranean by ship or cross Spain and go into Portugal. From Bruges, they could cross the Channel to London. The length of time it took for a letter to get from its sender to its recipient varied according to the time of year, the weather, and the conditions of the horses and riders. The merchants in Florence, however, expected to be able to get a message from Florence to Paris 700 miles in 20 to 22 days, to Bruges 800 miles in less than 25 days, and London 1000 miles in less than 30 days. This last didn't take into account the unpredictability of crossing the channel at the best of times and these speeds were probably more wished for than achieved. It wasn't just merchants who needed a courier service for their letters. The church had one too. Letters were constantly going on between clerics in England and other countries and the papal court in Avignon. Letters also went between the papal court and the secular rulers of Europe. They also used couriers to carry letters between themselves and those of the subjects they wished to communicate with. Possibly the most famous courier of the 14th century although not for being a courier was Geoffrey Chaucer. In October 1360 he was paid nine shillings by Lionel of Antwerp, in whose retinue he was serving, to carry letters from France to England, presumably announcing Lionel's imminent return. Doubtless, he carried other letters while he was still a lowly member of Lionel's household. In the 15th century, people wrote letters for many reasons, if they could write at all, and the first challenge was to get it down on paper late medieval letter writers were concerned with many of the same topics that move us today. Men and women nurtured long-distance love affairs, lawyers debated legal disputes, and buyers of property discussed houses. Letter writers ranged from high-ranking servants to royalty. Women were prominent senders and recipients of mail. For example, there are over 60 surviving letters sent by Margaret Paston of Norfolk to her lawyer husband, John, whose work took him away to London. Correspondence could range from the mundane to the out of the ordinary. A letter that Margaret sent to John in 1448 urged him to dispatch crossbows to fight off attacks by hostile neighbors. Margaret reported that servants had made bars across the doors and were shooting from every corner of the house. Margaret then goes on to ask for almonds, sugar, and cloth to make the children new gowns. Correspondents often penned the letters, especially if they were merchants and lower-ranking gentlemen. 
yet the preferred option was for servants to do the writing, especially for gentlewomen, who rarely put pen to paper. Medieval people did not see handwriting as proof of a letter's authenticity in the way that we do today. So when the handwriting of wealthy men or women does appear, it often looks inelegant, because they did not need to practice. As the 15th century drew to a close, more correspondents began to write their letters. However, before then, the best way to put words onto paper was through the hand of a trusted scribe. Once they'd finished writing, scribes could dry the ink quickly by dusting it with ashes from the chimney. Then they'd fold the letter, tie it up with strips of paper, and give it a wax seal. In the days before a national postal service, selecting the right man or woman to convey the letter to its destination was critical once the name and address were written on the outside, the missive was ready to begin its journey. Though letters traversed England with great frequency in the 15th century, there was no sign yet of a postal system that we would recognize today. That only developed after the appointment of the first master of the posts, Brian Tuke, in 1512. In the century before any signs of a regulated post, there were three main ways to send a letter, with your servant, with a paid messenger, or with a carter, who hauled heavy goods around the country. Using your servant was the safest and cheapest option, but it was not always possible to spare a member of the household for what might turn out to be a long journey. Paying a messenger or carter to deliver your message was often more convenient, especially if the letter was following a well-traveled route. However, it could be difficult to find a messenger able to travel at the right time, so letters often sat unposted for days. In 1448, one servant of the night Sir John Festolf wrote to excuse his tardiness in replying to his master's correspondence, if messengers to London could have been found before Christmas, the letters were ready to go. Journeys in medieval England could be hazardous, so correspondents could only pray that their letters weren't intercepted en route, I would rather a letter be burnt than lost, wrote a servant of Sir John Festolf. Why was he moved to reach this conclusion? because 15th century England could be a hazardous place for a letter to travel around, especially if the letter contained sensitive information. Medieval writers lived in fear that an enemy might intercept confidential correspondence and turn it against them as evidence in a legal dispute. The same servant mentioned above added a classical Latin metaphor to demonstrate the strength of his concern, Neforte vibrant Romani, which translates as, lest perchance the Romans should see it. Knowledge was power, especially in the possession of your enemies. It was not just malice that threatened the medieval missive. With so many letters and other goods traveling around the country, there was a risk that a letter might go astray. This misfortune befell Walter Paston in 1479 when one of his letters was mistakenly dispatched to London with some money sent to the capital for safekeeping. Paston later explained this mishap thus, Mr. Brown had a lot of money in a bag, which he dared not bring with him and at that time my letter was in the same bag. He forgot to take out the letter, and sent it all together to London. Pity the poor messenger. He might travel hundreds of miles to deliver a letter, then, once he'd arrived, could only pray that someone was home if the letter's safe passage to its intended recipient was a source of stress to the correspondent, then spare a thought for the man or woman charged with delivering it. The medieval equivalent of today's postman sometimes had to travel from one end of the country to the other to convey letters to the person to whom they were addressed. And, as medieval property owners often moved regularly between several houses, there was no guarantee that the recipient would be at home when they got there. One letter written in 1450 to the chaplain of Caister Castle in Norfolk gave no less than three alternative points of delivery for the bearer to try if the chaplain was not to be found at the castle. And if the messenger arrived at the wrong time, he was often in for a long wait. A man who carried a letter for William Stoner of Oxfordshire reported back that he had tried to deliver it, but that the recipient was not at home. He reassured Stoner that he would try again later, John Cheney is out hunting with his hawk, as soon as he comes home I will deliver your letter. Sometimes a letter could send its recipient into a fit of rage. That's when it paid to select a messenger who was skilled in the art of conciliation so the messenger has finally delivered your precious letter. Yet that didn't necessarily mean their work was done. Sometimes they were also tasked with delivering a verbal message. In other instances, especially if the recipient was offended by the contents of the letter, they might have to act as a diplomat. In 1449, 
the Paston family had to use a female servant to convey a letter to a man who had forcibly taken possession of their manor, because no male servant was willing to take the risk. At a time of heightened tension, using a woman letter-bearer paid dividends. She was, we're told, received with great cheer, and her spoken message was listened to graciously. Previous male messengers hadn't enjoyed such a warm reception. Some people insisted that letters be destroyed, while, luckily for us, others were obsessed with filing them away some 15th century writers gave instructions that their letters should be burnt after reading. Others put the most sensitive information at the foot of the page, intending it to be torn away and disposed of. Each of these methods was designed to restrict access to confidential information. However, the very survival of these letters shows that such commands were not always obeyed. It seems that medieval correspondents' desire to avoid written records were equaled by an obsession with keeping evidence. Sir John Fastolf had a specially designed archive in the Tower of Caister Castle, where his servants collected his letters and other documents. Just like today, designing a method for sorting and storing this material could be difficult. Fastolf's servants regularly had trouble finding written material once it had been put away. Even his stepson complained that he could not find any of the records he needed, nor could any man that he knew of. However, despite the flaws in the organizational system, it protected the letters from loss or damage. It is this obsession with preserving written evidence that we have to thank for the survival of medieval letters today, letters that tell us so much about how people organized their lives during that fascinating period. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more videos.